Hey, Coxie. How are you? What do you got for me today, Coxie? Look, it's been just so hot in Brisbane this week. I've been thinking about moving to Moscow. All right. But there's no point rushing into things. Welcome to the Tradies and Business Podcast with your hosts, Warwick Bidwell and Nicole Cox. Divert your phone and grab a brew as Waz and Nick unpack tips, tales, secrets and stuff-ups from guests both inside and outside your trade. Helping educate and inspire you to break the cycle of gut-busting and money stress and create a true trade business. Oh, come on. Okay, um, well, you were you were interested in my move to Tasmania. <laughs> I would be baffled if you moved to Russia. <laughs> I don't quite know how we're going to run business from Russia and Tasmania, but you know. Yeah, do they have internet in Moscow or Moscow? Pretty sure it'll be uh, monitored if they do. <laughs> Ooh, that's a pretty good segue. It is a bit. Uh, as well as arguments, um, we're going to talk about arguing today. I love this topic. You and I do this regularly and well. What, argue? Yes. <laughs> I must admit, I, I have a real um, fear of conflict. I find it very right. uncomfortable and I've struggled with it in my life, despite the fact that I've had plenty of conflict <laughs> and lots of arguments with people. So um, I'm really... Fascinated to chat with today's guest. We are joined by Nicole Davidson. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you, Was. Lovely to be here. Nice to meet you too, Nick. Thank you, Nicole. This is going to get really confusing today, guests. We've got two Nicoles. <laughs> so we'll, we'll abbreviate mine to one of my many nicknames. It'll be Nick or Coxie. You, you choose, but you'll know. I'm sure you're going to figure out the voices as we go anyway. I reckon they will. Yes. Uh, so, Nicole, you're a professional arguer. Is that right? That's an interesting way of putting it. Um, <laughs> I like to describe myself as a specialist in helping people have those uncomfortable conversations more comfortably. I love Ooh. that explanation. That's a fantastic elevator um, pitch. It is, isn't it? <laughs> yes. There you go. What do you do? That was that was brilliant. I can't repeat it, so I won't try. <laughs> you can go back and listen to the recording later, Was. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay, I love Nicole already. She's bringing the sass to yeah, the morning. Yeah, right I love on. it. So Coxie's going to run today's interview. <laughs> and, and I'm going to crack the sads, which is probably how a lot of uh, conflict happens, Nicole. Mm. Yeah, well, it's interesting that you say that um, – you prefer to avoid conflict. And I think that's what happens um, a lot of the time. I mean, a lot of people are naturally conflict averse mm. and it's much easier to cave in and just give someone what they want than stand up for what you want. Mm. Um, but the other thing is people who aren't conflict averse can actually make a real problem as well because they go in like a bull at a gate. Mm. Um, and, you know, if you've got two people who are both up for a bit of conflict, you're in real trouble. So it's always like most things in life. It's always about having a bit of balance. Mm. I think it's a bit of a learned skill to not to argue, but to navigate those tough conversations well. So I, I feel like it's really interesting what you do, Nicole, but I'm intrigued. How did you come to be doing this in the first place? <laughs> that is an awesome question. And um, like one of the other guests that I just recently listened to, it's a bit of a long story. Um, my background is, um, well, my qualification is a legal qualification. So I'm a qualified lawyer, but I haven't practiced law since the last century. Mm -hmm. um, I started in commercial work. So I did a law commerce degree. I worked in, well, I did my legal qualification. I worked in commercial insolvency for a while, which in, involved a little wow. bit in the building industry as well. Mm -hmm. um, then I moved into investment banking. Mm -hmm. And after a little while, I had this little epiphany going, none of these is actually doing what I really want to be doing, which is helping people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a common theme that, that's come across from some of the episodes that I've heard as well. Um, I moved into the people development space. So I started looking at learning strategies and how to help people learn, but then more um, fell into training. And from a generalist training role, I then became a negotiation and conflict resolution training specialist. Mm -hmm. um, after a few years of doing that, it took me all the way back to where I'd started from in that sort of legal realm going, the way that we manage disputes is 
you know, we're, we're stuck in this adversarial legal process that encourages conflict and discourages dialogue. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I went from just training in that negotiation and conflict resolution space to um, mediating to help people resolve disputes without all of the legal costs, complications, delays, stress, all of that, mm-hmm. um, and advising people on specific negotiations, whether that's you know, a positive kind of deal negotiation. We want to buy a business or we want to put in a new supplier agreement or whether it's a conflict negotiation. Sometimes you just need a little bit of guidance and support because although in business we negotiate every single day, you know, whether it's a conversation with a staff member, whether it's with one of our clients, um, we're always negotiating, but most of us have never, ever been taught how to do it. And so what I bring to people's conversations is the structure and the strategy. Um, And as they work through that with me, they sort of develop those skills so that they can do it on their own um, in the future. So that's sort of the the quick version of of how I got to be where I am, Coxie. I love that idea. In my experience, I've had unfortunately a fair bit of legal experience in my time and it's it's almost like point scoring and tip for tap. We don't have authentic conversations about solving a problem we end up um, point scoring until we find or, or law determines a resolution rather than creating an outcome that could be beneficial for all parties. So, you know, even bringing that back to the many conflicts that arise through owning a, a building company, whether, oh. it, like you say, with with team, um, maybe a few with my business partner, um, plenty with clients, etc. Those, um, the, well, I wouldn't call them basic skills, but those they're very important skills to be able to find a commonality or, or a place where everybody gets. Absolutely. And, and I think the word right that out. I use is they're fundamental skills. They're not basic. They're complicated. Yeah. Well, they're not complicated in theory. They're complicated in practice because of the fact that we're human and our brains do funny things that we don't necessarily want them to do. So, Mm -hmm. but they are certainly fundamental. And I think what's interesting as well, I've got, you know, a number of my uh, business connections are in the the conflict resolution space as well. And even some of them, when when they've been involved in their own personal conflicts, everything that they know as a professional goes out the window (laughs) because of the human element of all of this. And this is where bringing someone in who doesn't have the emotional ties, who doesn't have the sort of um, very sort of solid views and, you know, a limited background as to their own experience, bringing someone in who's more broad than that can really help people Mm -hmm. move through things. And, you know, I'm all about let's avoid conflict um, rather than have to deal with it. I mean, not avoid it, but let's, let's deal with it early so it doesn't mm. escalate. Mm. Um, and partnership disputes, interestingly, um, business ownership disputes are one of the areas that I really love working in because I liken it very much to divorce. You can go to counselling to start with. So when the problems start, you go and get counselling. Yep. Um, most people skip that step and they end up straight in divorce. Yeah. Um, so, you know, all of these different areas um, provide lots of opportunity anytime a human is connecting with another human. Yeah, that's so true. <laughs> Isn't it incredible what uh, emotion and also your ego can be responsible yeah. for when it comes to these conversations? They really they have no place in any kind of negotiation, I don't feel. I, I feel like if you're able to elevate your thoughts to a place to remove some of that emotion, you tend to have a far better outcome. However, you, I find that almost impossible to do. To, it to is. Stop those gut feelings of emotion it's, from getting It's involved. totally impossible to remove the emotion. And so um, I talk to people about acknowledging and, rec- well, firstly, recognising the emotion mm-hmm. and, secondly, acknowledging it and then figuring out where it fits. And, you know, what's going on in a lot of these things is is our brain takes all of these shortcuts. Whenever we're looking at a scenario, you know, it's like if you went to pick up a pen right now to write your name, you wouldn't think about, am I going to pick it up in my left hand or my right hand? It would just be instinctive. And there's all of these thinking shortcuts that work in conversations as well. Mm. And there's a few that really play into the kind of discussions that we have. So for example, if I have a customer who has been really obnoxious to me, very difficult to deal with, and something comes up, I will notice 
when they say something that's obnoxious or um, offensive because it's what I expect to hear. Mm -hmm. The time that they give me a compliment and they actually say thank you, I'm probably going to forget about that because it actually it creates what we call cognitive cognitive dissonance. It doesn't fit with what I already know. Mm -hmm. So I think it must be a mistake. I just chuck it out. And unless we're really conscious of some of these things, and some things are impossible to be conscious about, you know, they've shown you can teach people about all of these many cognitive biases or thinking shortcuts. And even though they know about them, they'll still be impacted by them because they're that's the brain's programming. Mm. But you can start to slow yourself down and go, hang on, what's happening here? Am I just looking for the bad because that's my experience? Mm-hmm. Sounds like probably anybody in a, a long-term relationship with uh, another human, Absolutely. husbands and wives out there are probably thinking, uh, this sounds a little bit close to home. Yeah. And I would say as well with employees, uh, a lot of our listeners would have staff or employees and and I find and I've noticed over the years of coaching people that they either have the the bias in a positive way towards yep. employees and they and they miss the balance. They miss the things where, you know, as coaches, Coxie and I can come in and say, oh, you've shared a few things that are probably raising a red flag for us about this person. No, 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 they're awesome. They're awesome. They're, they're a unicorn. And or it's the other way. Yeah. Everything that the, the employee does is like, oh my gosh, this guy's driving me crazy. He does this, that, and the other. It's like, yeah, but he's one of your best producers and you said that he's really good with clients. Have you missed that? It's weird how that happens. Like we just yeah. do this filter to Well, almost, and it and it works too. Totally right. It's it creates this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy because if you mm. think yeah. if you think John is really dodgy or you don't like him, you're not going to give him the good opportunities. So He's yeah, yeah. not going to develop the same way as others. Um, so, yeah, look, it, it's it's hard to overcome that without some sort of external person. And that's why having a coach um, is really important in business. Mm. Mm. We have a few <laughs> conflict resolutions ourselves with our – or uh, helped our clients – uh, have some less emotional conversations, yeah. providing some balance. And I think that's a, a fantastic key to why services such as yours work really well, Nicole, is um, we lose perspective when we're in yeah. these, these conversations and a healthy dose of perspective can really change an outcome. Um, and often uh, when we're playing that third party, which we do as coaches from time to time, um, we have that perspective without the emotional attachment to either the outcome or, or even the investment in what's happening in the first place. So it allows us to help navigate through those conversations. But I wonder if there is a way to completely avoid the need for negotiation or conflict at all. <laughs> Uh, well, that's quite interesting. You might have noticed I have a little poster up on the, the wall behind me. It says negotiations a little bit like breathing. You don't have to, but the alternatives aren't very attractive. <laughs> um, and I think it comes back to what is our perception of negotiation and what is our perception of conflict? And I think a lot of people look at those two things as negatives. We don't want to have to mm. negotiate. We don't want to have to have conflict. And I think it's actually the mindset that you bring to it that's really important. So negotiation happens all the time. You know, mm. from the very first moment you come out, you want some food, um, you you send a message, you cry, and you either get it or you don't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that is at, at its very core a basic negotiation. So negotiations all all over the place. Kids are kids, kids are amazing. They don't do it very well, but they try really hard. <laughs> yeah. um, and and actually, one of the most common pieces of advice that I get asked for is, "Can you help me negotiate with my two year old?" <laughs> and I say, I go right back to the experts at Harvard who say never negotiate with children or terrorists. So <laughs> let's just knock that off. Um, but conflict as well, um, and particularly if you're a conflict-averse person, you might see conflict as something that you want to avoid at all costs. It shouldn't be happening. I don't want to acknowledge that I've got a conflict because that means I've done something wrong if I've ended up in conflict. Mm -hmm. But conflict is just a difference of opinion, yes. and it's always going to happen. So another one, I have a whole gang of um, quotes that I like to use, but this one is combat is inevitable. Uh, sorry, conflict is inevitable. Combat is optional. Mm. So conflicts, differences of opinion, different perspectives will always arise. You know, yep. it's never possible for us to understand the whole of a situation. It's how we deal with that. And I think one of the problems is we don't go and get advice. We don't get advice from the right people. 
we might go to a friend for advice and they will they'll be like supporting us everyone oh, you've done nothing wrong no you've said exactly the right thing it's all great um no 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 you're all right they actually make it worse because they embed what we believe rather than challenging us and opening our perspectives mm. and that's where i think having the right kind of support at an early stage when things start to feel okay, we might not use the word conflict, things start to feel a little uncomfortable. I'm a little unsure of what to do. This is a situation that could end up badly. That's mm. the time to have a chat to somebody um, because they will open you up to different perspectives. Um, but I think, yeah, it, it's absolutely we need to change the mindset. Conflict is not a bad thing. So I feel like uh, this is this is like so many things in life. It's a... Uh, it's a spectrum or a river um, and some rivers go over waterfalls uh, and end in a big crash at the bottom. And we can actually get in or out of this, this sort of river earlier um, and not end up at these sort of catastrophic outcomes, whether it's our finances, whether mm. it's our relationships, or as we're talking about here with sort of negotiation and conflict, not turning into combat and then the catastrophic uh, end that some of those uh, result in. Is there, uh, in terms of negotiation, because I've, I've often had the same thing. You, you talked about negotiation. People see that as, I guess, a bad thing. And I've, I've um, often had a feeling about negotiation that it's, it's a battle. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going in there with an adversary, as you said earlier, Nicole. You know, there's adversarial sort of um, tone to it. Uh, but it sounds like it's not, doesn't have to be like that. And, and a good ne negotiation can actually avoid conflict and then combat is that Abs absolutely that yeah absolutely and and look it's interesting so I, I was asked once a couple of years ago when Donald Trump was still president somebody said to me can you come and do a keynote for us about why Donald Trump is such a good negotiator mm -hmm. and I refused to do it and the reason I did was because if you look at negotiation as an adversarial process you may well go someone like Donald Trump is a good negotiator because he always gets outcomes that he wants, you know, that are mm. good for him. Mm. But I said to them, if you, so, you know, he's talking the property development um, space as his main business. If you had the best property development deal in the world, this was going to be an amazing deal and you needed someone to partner with, would you go and approach Donald Trump with this deal? And I'm going most people probably wouldn't because they don't want to have to negotiate with him because of the way he negotiates. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how good are you as a negotiator if people don't want to negotiate with you, he's missing yeah. out on opportunities because of the way he negotiates. And so I think that's a really important thing to think about with negotiation. Now, um, I know you talked in one of your previous episodes about the book um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Great yes. book. <laughs> um, interesting, though. I, I think the interesting thing for me, and I have to say I've delved into it, but I haven't actually gone through the whole book. Um, I've gone through many, many negotiation books, but I haven't got through that one in total yet. But the interesting thing I look at is Chris Voss has built his expertise in hostage negotiations. Mm. They are negotiations that are a once-off negotiation and then they end. Mm. The difference that we have when we're negotiating as a tradie um, or any business owner is we want to have an ongoing relationship. And I think there's some differences that apply. And I think some of Chris's stuff is fantastic and mm. I know you talked about the yes and, and and some other techniques that he uses, the FM presenter voice. Um, <laughs> but it, it also, I think we need to recognise that this is an ongoing relationship that we want to be dealing with in most of these situations. And everything that I do is based around theory. I don't come in and just go, oh, this is what I've tried and it worked for me. I go back to the Harvard stuff mainly and the book that I um, recommend to people if they haven't already read it is Getting to Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've come across that one. For those who haven't read it, there is a summary of Getting to Yes on my website. So if you don't want to read the whole book, which you don't really need to, just um, pick up that <laughs> summary. Um, but it's, it's what they call interest-based or collaborative negotiation. And, and I always say there are three key skills that you need to have if you want to be a great negotiator. The first one is bringing a mindset of curiosity. Love you actually need to understand what's going on here. Mm -hmm. What's going on for me? What's going on for them? 
Then you pair that up with asking great questions. So knowing how to formulate a good question and the right question to ask at the time to encourage others to speak. Um, and then if you're going to ask good questions, the third skill you need is you need to be an incredibly good listener. Um, and listening, although, it, you know, we, we hear, we, these words come into our ears, but often while, while our client's talking to us, telling us all about what they're unhappy about, we're already busy thinking about how am I going to respond to this? What am I going to tell them? Oh, my God, these are all the reasons that they're wrong. And we're not actually listening to them. Mm. And I find in some of the dispute work that I do, particularly in the small business area, if the person had just sat down and listened to the person's complaint, if they felt like their grievance was being heard and understood, things would never have escalated to the point that they've gotten to. Okay. So if you can develop those three skills, um, you're halfway there. Couldn't agree more. I think uh, it's a skill... Listening, I'll refer to listening most importantly. It's something that we do a lot as coaches and we have to listen to the conversations or the issues that our clients bring to us, but they're not really the problems that they're trying to express. And your clients as a trade business owner, whilst they might be really annoyed that you didn't sweep up or they might be annoyed that there's an extra hole in the wall or it's taking a bit longer, that's not actually their yeah. concern. And so the second part there where we're asking the right kind of questions can help you get to that issue um, that's at the heart of the big problem here so that we can work towards a resolution instead of getting stuck in that to and fro, tip for tap, but you're wrong or I didn't do this. And I think that also stops it from being a personal attack. When we're a business mm. owner, it often feels like I'm being told I'm not good enough. Yes. That's all I'm hearing through my filter as a business owner rather than understanding that's not actually what's being said. What's being said is my mother-in-law is arriving next week and I'm really embarrassed because the job isn't finished yet. I was trying to impress her. It's probably about the client feeling less than enough. In There's probably moment. something going on between the husband and wife potentially as well. I'm getting in trouble because she's angry at me, mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to pass it on to you absolutely and and what you said there about um that sense of getting a personal attack is really critical because what that's doing is triggering a stress response in the brain and um you know for various reasons when we have that stress response our brain's flooded with adrenaline and cortisol because we have the same response whether it's a physical threat or a psychological threat mm -hmm. Um, if we're physically threatened, we get adrenaline, we get cortisol, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure starts pumping, and we're ready to run away or fight back. Mm. And in that running away or fighting back, the adrenaline cortisol all sort of drains out and we get back to normal. But when we've got a psychological threat, that adrenaline and cortisol stays in the system. Mm. And the problem with that is it actually shuts off the neocortex, which is the part of our brain that sits at the front that does all of our rational thinking. And so if you get this personal attack, oh, my God, you're attacking me because this thing hasn't been done, it's easy for that to be triggered. Mm -hmm. And what's really important for people is to have some mechanism to recognise when this happens. You can't stop it from happening, but recognise what it happen, when it happens and then break that cycle so that you're not flooding your system with adrenaline and cortisol. So the easiest way, and any parent who's ever been told you know, when your kids do something, stop and count from one to 10, yeah. that is your classic break that system. So if somebody says something and you can feel yourself, and, and it is, it's this physical reaction that's going on in the body. If you can just pause and take a long, slow breath in and release it before you speak, you will possibly avoid saying something that you wish you hadn't said. <laughs> That's a skill that has gotten me to where I am today. <laughs> I couldn't live without that one. But I think I, I, that was going to be my follow-up question. So interesting that you, you mentioned that. We're not taught to pause at any no. stage. I don't recall ever being taught to just take a moment. Yes, you read about it when once you have children. By then it's so deeply ingrained that you explode and react rather than t just taking a breath and a moment before yeah. we do respond so that we're choosing to respond rather than react. react. Um, Look, I mean, we're not taught. And, and look, I think I think this ties into something else that I think is really important to think about is, you know, we, we live in a world of rush. Mm. Everything happens quickly. So to stop and slow down, um, you know, sometimes you don't want to slow down because you feel like it's going to give the other person scope to keep checking stuff at you. Mm -hmm. um, so if I respond, I stop them from talking. Um, but more generally, we act quickly 
a lot of the time. And I think if you look at where some of these conflicts come from, um, it's because we've gone too fast up front. And so I talk to people, particularly when I'm doing training courses, I talk about this concept of go slow to go fast. Mm. And I've had experience of this myself. And, and if I can use a real example just to illustrate this, and, you know, it just shows how easily misunderstandings and conflicts can arise. So we were doing some renovations a few years ago and we had a builder come in, lovely guy, family friend, as well as a builder. Everything was going swimmingly. And one of the things we were doing, we had a fireplace that had an old tiled half. And we wanted to replace the old tiles with a... I think it was granite. Or, I can't remember if we went for granite or, granite or marble. I think it's granite. It doesn't have little lines going through it. <laughs> um, anyway, so we said, if you can measure up, we'll go and organise the hearthstone. So we got the measurements from the builder, get the granite, come back. And when we put the mantelpiece up, the granite was like a centimetre and a half short on each side. It wasn't big enough. I'm like, what are you doing? Mm. You know, you've measured it wrong. And he's like, no. I just measured the space that was there at the start. None of us had realised that the half that was there was actually too short for the existing mantle. It had never come across my notice and it had never come across his. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my assumption was that he was going to measure the correct size for the hearthstone, <laughs> which would be on the mantelpiece, mm -hmm. you know, and his was... I'll just measure what was there because that would have been correct. Now, that led to a conflict, of course. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, who's responsible for the fact that we've now got this piece of stone <laughs> that is too small? And he'd, and by the time the mantle went on, he'd already glued it down. So there was no taking it back. <laughs> He's like, it's it's going to be cactus. Um, and so, look, this is, this is one of those really interesting situations going, okay, well, now what do we do? Who's responsible? Mm -hmm. Now, if we had slowed down at the start and actually gone, okay, let's look at this, let's make sure, let's double check things, that would never have happened. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. because we were just like, okay, let's just, this is what we want, let's go. And we didn't ask the question, what could go wrong here? Mm -hmm. And it's one of the questions I do so often particularly when I'm working in mediations and dispute resolution and they get to an agreement before I let them sign the document, I'm always like, what could go wrong? Mm. Um, but we didn't do that. We just made a decision and went. And I have to say, in case anyone's interested, because it's always bad when you get a half finished story in the end, I was absolutely dead set against ripping this granite up and throwing it out because that just seemed environmentally wasteful to me. So we ended up building a frame around it. So it's a bit of a compromise. Um, <laughs> he did the he did the work on the frame. Um, and I think that was covered by him um, for the materials and stuff. But um, I think we did, we split it anyway, but we had a very civilised conversation about it. I hope that was always going to be guaranteed. But, you know, when it's your own dispute, it's always harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of yeah. course it is. Yeah, because emotion comes in again. It does. I was devastated. And I still, I have to say, this is one of the things where I go, maybe I should have done something differently because every time I walk into that room and I see that hearth, I'm like, God damn it, that stone's not the right shape. <laughs> it's got this stupid fray around. <laughs> I would do my head in. <laughs> Hey, tradies in business, was here. Sorry to interrupt your listening pleasure. I'm joined by Coxie, of course. <laughs> Hello. You may not know this, tradie or tradie wife or whoever you are listening to this program, but we're business coaches. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, that feels I weird know. to say. <laughs> <laughs> but we do actually work with people just like you to solve a bunch of problems. And we have this fantastic program called the Tradiepreneur Program, and that's how we do it. And we do it with a wonderful community of trade business owners who are all trying to fix or improve or change things to progress. Things like getting behind on quoting, Coxie. Feeling overwhelmed, behind on your invoicing, feeling really stressed or frustrated about the money stuff. Sometimes you can pay the bills, sometimes you can't. What about staff? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my gosh, staff. Trying to get them to do what you want them to do, if you can even find them in the first place. Uh, there's so many struggles. And we've seen clients tackle these things in their trade businesses in a quite a short space of time, to be honest. Mm -hmm. 
during the program and recruit staff at a time where everybody was saying you can't get good staff, mm -hmm. improve their quality from their team, collect their debts much more quickly. We How have about sessions. Getting tips? Yes, getting tips. Yes, so uh, people rounding up customers, rounding up the invoice by hundreds of dollars mm -hmm. because they're so happy with the sales process and the experience of dealing with the trade business owner and their team. So, some amazing stories from our clients. But you know, as they say in the in the commercials, don't take it from us. Uh, <laughs> hear what some of our clients have to say. Coming into Christmas. We are not worried about money. We've got enough money in the bank to pay everybody's leave. There's work booked in for the new year. And for the first time in a long time, we'll be having three weeks off and not worrying about the business. That's probably the biggest win of all. Using the cash flow forecast, I've been able to look into the future and see where I'm going to be situated financially. And it's actually started to have a huge bearing on whether or not I make purchases. By far one of the best things about working with Nick and Woz are the other businesses that are working alongside them. It is amazing how empowering it is to be working alongside like-minded people who have similar goals, similar troubles. We can all relate to each other and everybody helps everybody out by figuring out problems with you that they may have faced previously. Everybody has solutions and constructive feedback, and it's an incredibly friendly, warm, welcoming environment, not threatening at all. From every job, I know that I will get a sustainable wage that's industry leading. I can have at least 10 to 20% profit, and I can pay taxes, super, all of that, and I do not have to question whether or not I can because of the way that it's been built, and that is thanks to traders in business and what they've taught me and what I've learned. So there you go. There's some real people. We did not pay them to say those things. <laughs> and I think that sounds a lot better than Coxie and I reading them out. We really would love for you to check out more about how you could take your trade business to where you would like it to be. Surely you have a vision of what things could be like or what you wish they were like on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. um, whether that is reducing stress or actually making more money. Maybe it's spending more time with the family, taking more holidays, having the choice mm. that you really wanted when you started your business instead of this beast that seems to be there for many of you listening to this program. So if you want to find out more about how we do this through the Tradepreneur program, Coxie's going to tell you all about it. <laughs> I'm actually not. I'm going to be really secretive and uh, keep all of our magic up our sleeves. What I would like you to do, though, is head on over to tradiesandbusiness.com.au. You can learn all about us, why we do what we do, and how you can work with us, what that actually looks like. There's a whole bunch of free stuff there for you to download, uh, lots of options. We've always got new stuff going up onto the website and a great place for you to learn a whole bunch more about how you can work with us. You can even book a 15-minute chat. For free free that's how abundant we are so head over to the website uh, check it out book a chat with us and we'd love to find out if you'd be a great fit for the tradiepreneur community and start hanging out with some of those people that you just heard from <laughs> we talk a lot about setting expectations and how they can save so much of this drama and i think um i think one of the the key things that all business owners forget regardless of the type of business is they inherently know their business, the processes, yes. what that looks like. But the person that you're communicating with or you're serving doesn't understand any of that. And without totally. setting those expectations, they make assumptions that create so many issues that could be avoided. That's it. And I think that's exactly what I was going to say. It's this knowledge imbalance that gets in the way. And, you know, for a tradie going into that, I guess if you're relatively new, it's difficult. But every time you have an issue come up, you're learning the kind of questions that you need to ask and the discussions that you need to have with someone going further. So the more experienced you are, um, and I think this is the learning that you've got to do is every time you have a problem, don't think of it as a bad thing. Think of it, now I know how to protect, prevent those in the future. Mm. And I want to share those with my staff so I'm helping them develop it without having to go through the challenges themselves. And I think that's a really important thing of going, you know, we don't all need to make the same mistakes. Let's share them mm. um, so that we can help each other learn and develop. Mm, I feel like there's a persistent 
um, I don't know if it's a culture, but there's a, there's a persistent attitude towards mistakes and failure amongst people, and and I think mm-hmm. especially business people, and even more especially trades people, that mistakes are bad, and they're somehow a failing, and they're a, they're a stain on our reputation and our our record, uh, and yet the in my experience over many many years of working with them as a coach. Um, but also just hanging around with mates who are tradies and, you know, family members, the the best craftspeople, the best, you know, the people who have mastered their craft, whether it's the trade, whether it's like us in professional services and advice, is we've actually made more mistakes than anybody else. Um, and it's more, as, you, as you've been rightly pointing out, Nicole, it's not that there was a disagreement or a conflict. It's how we handle that. Mm. And I think banking those as... Um, learnings, which which you know, people write off what we say as coaches and consultants because, like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, it's just co- coach wanker speak. <laughs> but it's it's actually the pathway to getting great results. And you know, our business coach um, that Nicole and I work with has made plenty of mistakes in his time. Uh, and I think you know, if they're celebrated, particularly with with staff when our mm-hmm. listeners are working with their team. If we actually celebrate the making of the mistake, again, it's like kids. You know, I, I I celebrate my daughter's mistakes. It's like, oh, that was awesome. Yeah. You tried so hard. Look what happened, you know. I what think, can we do next time? I think it's the difference between making a mistake and making the same mistake over and over. Yes. Absolutely. Um, you know, making a mistake, absolutely, that's what we need to do. We need to be there because if we're not making mistakes, we're not trying things, we're not learning, we're not pushing boundaries. But when we consistently do the same thing over and over again, that's that's where we're making a real mistake. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, or not learning. So we're not taking the learning from that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that's a deficiency that needs to be dealt with. Absolutely. And, and, you know, for people who want to improve the way that they manage conflict or negotiations, I always say there's just two quick questions to ask after each conflict conversation or a negotiation conversation. And that's just, what did I do in that conversation that worked well? What mm. am I happy with? And what's one thing that I could have done differently and how would I do do it differently next time? And if you just take a few minutes to reflect after each conversation on those two questions, you will automatically develop your skills over time and become better and better at what you do. I'd love everyone to do that before they speak to anyone else about the conflict because I think it goes back to that point you made earlier. We go out seeking for the truth to, well, our version of the truth Mm. to be reflected to us. Mm. So my temptation might be to go and talk to my partner or my children and complain about the conversation I've just had and they're always going to tell me I'm right. So I don't have that opportunity to learn. I've, I've removed that perspective. Yep. So I think you have to sit with that uncomfortable feeling that comes straight after any kind of negotiation or conflict um, and really look honestly at yourself and that can be very challenging to do. It's never nice to to have a look at perhaps where you've gone wrong and what might need to be done next time. Yeah. Well, it's very rare that a conflict has arisen purely because one person's done the wrong thing. There's normally That's... contribution from both people. Mm. It goes to a lot of the principles we teach here at Tradies and Business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Taking ownership and responsibility and I'm thinking about a few of our tradiepreneur clients at the moment. It's like... Oh, I'm really, I'm going to prescribe this episode to them. (laughs) (laughs) Need a few uh, loving baseball bats to the head. Mm -hmm. That's our job, is it not? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Nicole, um, so in your role as, uh, I guess, a a negotiator, um, what are some of the, I guess, key skills that you bring to the table you know if, if someone's listening to this and going okay well what makes a good negotiator and we talked about the donald trump example earlier yep. um we've talked about those great questions and listening um are there other qualities that that you know someone's like well okay i want to work on being better at this with my staff with my clients what are some of the things they can work on yeah great question um look there's, there's really three key areas that you can develop to become a good negotiator Um, The first is actually understanding the dynamics of what goes on in a negotiation. And and when I talk about negotiations, they are both the front end and the conflict discussions. Um, So it's learning about what are those different elements. And I I work off the model from Harvard called the seven elements model, which comes out of getting to yes. Um, There's a whole heap of stuff around this on my website. Um, But you need to actually understand, well, how do I break that down? 
And so often what I'm doing for people, um, and, and I work with people in a couple of ways just to sort of clarify. So I do anything from running training courses for groups. So I give them those fundamental skills that they can take away. That's normally done with some hypotheticals and some practice as well as learning the theory. Um, I work with them on specific transactions to help them, you know, get a better outcome um, on that. Or I come in as the independent neutral mediator to help two parties um, resolve things. So in all of those, I'm really looking at things to break down those key seven elements. The next thing you have to be good at is strategically planning. And once again, many of us, when we plan for a negotiation or a conflict conversation, the planning that typically we do is about getting all of our information into um, order. So if I've got a dispute with a client who is um, perhaps upset about some variations that I've put through, before I go into that conversation, I'm going to get down what the contract was. I'm going to track what the conversations were. I might have diary notes about what I said to them. Um, I might have invoices to show the cost of those extra materials. I've got all of my stuff together. Mm -hmm. That's only really half of the preparation for negotiation because I actually have to plan strategically around how I'm going to negotiate. And that could be things like, who am I going to have the conversation with? Do I have it just with the husband? Do I have it with the husband and the wife? When do I have it? Where do I have it? Um, how are we going to sit in that room? What are the questions that I'm going to ask? Or am I going to get them to talk first? So it's actually coming up with a strategic plan for how to have that negotiation, not just what to talk about. And then the final part of it is really around understanding the human elements. Um, and that's where, you know, a lot of what I've had to learn over the last few years as I've tradi tra transitioned into this is all around um, human psychology and understanding the psychology of conflict, what's going on in my head Mm -hmm. um, what are the things that are helping, what's getting in the way and what might be going on for them? And, and, and what do I do about those? So they're really the key elements to make you an expert negotiator. And, you know, as we said earlier, most of us never get taught to negotiate. Um, and that's where I bring that sort of expertise. And as I said, I mean, the benefit of going through a process is that you're actually learning this stuff. Certainly when I work with clients on the coaching or advising side, um, or even in the mediation, I'm explaining why I'm doing what I'm doing so that they can learn and apply that themselves going forward. Love it. Nicole, I'm looking for some dirt. Sorry, Warwick, I jumped on your toes there. <laughs> I'm wondering as a mediator, have you ever felt really triggered during a negotiation when you're playing what's meant to be a neutral role? I can imagine mm. for for me at times uh, I've had mediation with my ex-husband about children and, and things yep. like that must be quite challenging, I think, for the people in the room trying to navigate some of those conversations between two um, very conflicted parties for the most part. I wonder for you if you ever feel triggered in those conversations. Look, it's it's interesting. I mean, firstly, I'll say I don't dabble in family mediation at all for very good reason. <laughs> um, but, yes, yeah, I mean, look, there because we are human as mediators as well, there are certain people you just just, just find it harder to build an affinity with yeah. um it's probably been as I've sort of mediated over the last few years and, and had more experience it becomes easier to put that back into its little box and go you know what I'm here about the problem so for me it's about the problem and part of what I'm doing is actually looking at how the people are and how they operate and taking that back so in a mediation, some of the time will be spent in a joint room where we're all together and other times it will be me with the parties individually. And if somebody's got a particularly difficult personality, often the conversation I'm having in the other room is, well, tell me about how you think they operate. Tell me about what they're like as a person. Is that going to change? Oh, no, I'm going to have to continue to deal with that. So it's not about me having to change them or, or do that. And I try to, you know, that neutrality is really important for me to try and keep, but the reality is there's a limit to how neutral you can be. Mm. Um, but I'm mindful of, of not um, trying to let my feelings about a particular person mm -hmm. impact on what the outcome might be. But, you know, if somebody's particularly difficult and obnoxious and that's going to impact on what's the best outcome you're going to be capable of getting in that situation. 
Absolutely. Mm. That was a very professional answer. <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> it sounds like there's an element of acceptance that mm. um, needs to be practiced by at least one of the parties. Uh, as you said, if, if that other person is not going to change and you have to keep dealing with them, then perhaps we're going to have to work on accepting that that's how it's going to be with them. It, it can come. I think the challenge is when you've got someone who's particularly con- conflict averse, they want to just jump to acceptance at a very early stage. Yes. So it's working right. around what can be achieved given the limitations of who this person is and what their strategy is. And I have to say a lot of the time, you know, particularly when I'm in mediations, often they're in the shadow of litigation. So this mm. has already escalated so far mm. that often you've got lawyers involved and that changes the dynamics significantly. Yes. Um, and also people have now, by the time you get to litigation, people have not only had the problem, it's been going on for ages yeah. mm. because by the time you get to mediation, you know, a lot of lawyers won't go to mediation until the court orders it. Mm. So you've already spent a fortune mm. on statements of claim and defences and discovery and all of these legal processes that add very little to the dispute. Mm-hmm. Probably since the day you went to your lawyer, you haven't talked to the other party and possibly your lawyer hasn't even talked to the other lawyer. They've only exchanged emails and legal documents. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting that when the conversation stops, the ability to resolve the conflict stops as well. Mm -hmm. But it actually escalates it because the frustration levels go up. Mm -hmm. And I had one mediation. It was actually a, um, a retail leasing mediation. And we got to mediation and it actually resolved within about half an hour, which is astonishing. Like most of my mediations go for at least half a day. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what is going on here? And it turned out that the landlord and the tenant in that negotiation had been happily chatting away. It was a difficult scenario. It was all to do with COVID. And so it was really difficult, unfortunate scenario for everybody and hard to find a solution that was going to work for everyone. But they had been talking, chatting away, and the landlord decided that he needed to protect his interests. He needed to look after and make sure he was dotting his I's and crossed his T's, so he went to a lawyer. From that point on, the lawyer then sent a letter to the tenant. The tenant went, oh, he's gone legal. Um, no, 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 That I'm scared. Mm. Effectively, I'm scared, and stopped responding to anything. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so the only way the landlord could could get anything to move was to bring it to mediation. It was through the Victorian Small Business Commission, um, which was before litigation had started. Um, and once they got there and the landlord and tenant had a bit of a conversation, the problem was solved. Wow. <laughs> oh my um, but, you know, they'd wasted four months. Mm. Um, they'd spent money. Well, the, the landlord had certainly spent money on lawyers. Um, so there's this really fine balance. And, you know, I don't, Dis lawyers. I think lawyers have an absolutely important role. I'm actually married to a lawyer. Um, so I love lawyers. Uh, <laughs> but I think the way that we yeah, I think the way that we manage conflict and that legal is seen as the way of resolving conflicts has to be reconsidered. Mm. Yeah. You couldn't yeah. agree more. Legal and and dispute resolution are not the same thing. Exactly. They can happen, I guess, that way sometimes. Uh you, you know, I've I've had solicitors play a great role in, uh, you know, reaching agreement between parties. Yep. Um, but unfortunately, once an argument has started, it seems to be exactly as you said, Nicole, they go legal, um, to use yeah. that term, and then everybody just puts up the wall. And and there are some fantastic lawyers, particularly in my network, I know a number of lawyers who would do everything they can to keep their clients out of litigation mm. because yeah. they understand that the value is not there. Yeah. Um but the challenge is if you've got one, if you go and find a lawyer who's got that, um, that sort of mindset, but the lawyer for the other side doesn't, you find yourself stuck in a battle that you didn't really want to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that every dispute should go to mediation before you're allowed to litigate it. I yeah. think we'd get a lot of negotiations resolved that way without having to go through the court system at all. Um, a lot of lawyers don't like that. <laughs> I bet they don't. I think, I think our healthcare system and our legal system have a few parallels that uh, yeah. if we changed the, the pathway, it might save everyone a lot of money and a lot of heartache. Mm. But anyway, <laughs> I'll keep, keep that as my social commentary. <laughs> uh, 
Nicole, I got a bit of a wacky question for you. Um, there's there's the adage that you shared earlier: never negotiate with children or terrorists. Why do you think that is? Uh, I can answer that one. That's not that wacky. That's actually Ooh, okay. a really good question. <laughs> um, the reality, uh, the reason that that is. I don't know about terrorists so much, um, but for children, it's because their brains are actually not fully developed. Mm. The way that a child thinks is not the same that an adult thinks. Mm. So their capacity for rational, logical thought, their understanding of um, emotional intelligence and empathy is just not what a fully fledged adult has. Um, I suspect with terrorists, there could be some mm. element of um, they possibly have some kind of narcissism or some kind of other psychiatric um, mm. Mm. disruption to their brain that means that negotiating with them is not going to be effective. Mm. So I think it's all to do with having a fully operational normal, normal in inverted commas, um, yeah. <laughs> brain. That makes perfect sense. It also uh, explains why I should stop trying to negotiate with my Labrador. <laughs> Please don't. He does not. I have think no rationally. comment. I have no comment on negotiating <laughs> with pets. <laughs> he does not think rationally at all. <laughs> uh, Nicole, I have really enjoyed um, hearing you talk about this topic today, um, and I suspect we could listen to you a lot more. Um, I'm I'm sending non-verbal signals to Coxie about a thought that I'm having, but uh, we'll save that. <laughs> but I do have I do have the uh, the world famous question to wrap up our episode, uh, and that is: if you had a thousand tradies in a room, what is one piece of advice you would love to leave them with? My piece of advice would be: don't leave conflict un. Touch. Don't brush it under the carpet and hope it will go away. Accept that it's there. Deal with it early. Get support if you need it. And I will just, if it's okay, give a little plug there because one of the services that I offer is I figure people people don't have expert negotiation advice to hand and often don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. um, one of the services that I offer is it's effectively like a GP call for a conflict. So you book in, you've got a 15 minute, half an hour um, or an hour, depending on how big your conflict is. You have a quick chat with me. I ask you some of the key questions and we give you a bit of a strategy on how you might deal with that. So anyone who's there um, and wants to take their conflict to the doctor, um, that's something they can do through me. I think Ooh, I've got a few it. clients in mind that will have you on speak to <laughs> Nicole. I'm, I'm sorry, not sorry that you've yeah, yeah. mentioned that and <laughs> Well, it's like, not responsible for what's about to happen. Dr. Davidson, <laughs> I've got a rash. Can you help me with it? <laughs> yeah, your funny story about that in pharmacy was not funny at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um, now, Nicole, uh, I think that's great, a great service and a great opportunity for people to um, get unstuck. Um, what's the best place for people to find you online? Yeah, definitely the website has all my other contact details on it. So that's just Nicole Davidson Negotiation dot com dot au beautiful it's well uh i've enjoyed our chat today it's i'm going to stop negotiating with my labrador <laughs> and um and i'm sure our listeners have got a ton of value lots of our clients listen to this podcast as well so uh you know who you are if you're <laughs> listening to this episode probably pay you to get in touch with nicole uh not coxie nicole <laughs> uh, i know what coxie's going to tell you to do about your conflict I am. but uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah thanks heaps for your time today nicole it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future pleasure for me too thanks was and coxie thank awesome. you you've been listening to the tradies and business podcast with warwick bidwell and nicole cox find out more about today's guest tools for your trade business and other cool stuff at tradiesandbusiness.com.au